I once did an interview, right, mm. where I was like that, and I realised I hadn't hit record. <laughs> like literally about three quarters of the way through it. Are we, are we yeah, yeah. Yeah, we okay? yeah. Hello, I'm Don Weatherall, your host of the F5 podcast, brought to you by Intercity. Today, I'm extremely privileged to be joined by Barry Hodge. Uh, Barry is the head of fundraising um, and community over at St Basil's. Barry, welcome. It's a pleasure to be here, Dom. Thanks very much for, for having me on. Can you tell us a little bit about St Basil's, please? Of course, Barry. yeah. So where do you start about this charity that I'm fiercely passionate about? Um, we're a youth homeless charity. and We've been operating for the last 50 plus years. Um, we were founded in a, in a church building called St Basil's by a man called Les Milner, uh, who used to run a, a youth club. Uh, in the city. Came out one night, found two young men who were bedding down for the night who were members of the club. Um, they said, look, are you, you know, what's going on? He says, well, we're homeless, got nowhere to go. So he put them in the back of his, his more, uh, sorry, his mini clubmen, which are not quite as posh as they, you know, they are now, clearly. Mm -hmm. um, I drove around the city, managed to find a, a Salvation Army building for them to go to, but, but thought, is there any provisions for young people who are, are homeless in, in this city? There weren't. He said someone needed to do something about it, realised it was him, and then inadvertently found he does. But from there, we, we have grown into this this charity, this housing association, this, this, this organisation that supports between four and 5,000 young people every single year. And we'll accommodate around about 650 in any given night. We provide what's called floating support, um, so support to, to young people in their own tenancies, um, to around about 250 to 300 in any given day. Um, and our whole thing is about preventing youth homelessness, preventing it from happening in the first place, we hope, or at least preventing it from happening again. And it's done through a, a multitude of things like life skills workshops, employability programmes, um, mental health support, um, generally just being there. You know, that's what we do. And it's, um, it's something I'm really, really passionate about. Amazing charity, and okay. I'm I'm thankful and privileged that it's a little bit warmer than last time. We yeah, met. a little bit. Yeah, um, yes, we were doing uh, a sleep out, weren't we? During yeah, the, during the big yeah. sleep out yeah. uh, back in December, and yeah. we'll touch on that a yeah. bit in, in a bit more detail. But tell us a little bit about your career, please, Barry. How did you How did you get into doing this charity work? Oh, gosh. And Wait, how far do we go back? <laughs> um, uh, how long have you got? Okay, um, I'll, I'll try and sort of give you the, the abridged version. But um, so I, I I hold my hands up. I, I had no desires to work for a charity. You know, when I was in my you know career phase or before before I got into it, um, I you know I'm clearly not from around the Midlands. Um, can't sneak my French accent past anyone. Apologies, <laughs> terrible joke. Um, but uh, but I had always wanted to work in radio when I was growing up and. Um, Radio is, is a medium that I, I absolutely love and and still you know you know so passionate about. There's nothing more powerful than a a one to one conversation about like what we're doing. You just feel now. at home now. I then, feel at yes. home. This is yeah. my happy place. Yeah. I, I love podcasts now. You know, I mean, and when I was in the radio industry, it was it was sort of before podcasts. I was I think I was about eighteen. Um, in fact, go back before that. I I would you know even though I'm quite a confident individual now, it sounds like I am. I was um, I was someone who spent a lot of time at home. I was quite withdrawn, and the radio was my friend. You know, so I'd listen to these radio presenters of where I'm from with names like Tiger Tim Stevens, Scotty McClue. You know, these were the you know yeah. guys characters that they had in the radio, and they were amazing. Um, and then I was 18. I started university. I uh, was studying social sciences. Uh, Realised one day when I was looking around that there was like 200 people on my course. They were all going to graduate with the same degree. We were all going to have the same experience. How was I going to get a job? And then I was like, well, what do I want to do in my life? What do I really want to do? And I remember having a you know, CV in front of me. I was like, I'm at uni. I work part-time in Sainsbury's pushing the trolleys. Um, can I get a job in radio? Because that's what I want to do. So I wrote to all these radio stations in Scotland and sent it off, and one got back to me, um, which was a, a radio station in Fort William, so near Ben Nevis. Everyone else is lost. Yeah, yeah. yes, everyone, <laughs> well, you know, at that time, maybe not. You know, um, But the guy there was a man called Willie Cameron. Um, he ran this community radio station called Nevis Radio, and Willie was an amazing man, sadly no longer with us, but he was, you know, he instrumental in giving a lot of people opportunities, and nobody realised at the time just how powerful it was. So he said, yeah, come up, um, can't pay you any money. I'm from Glasgow, bear in mind, I've just passed my driving test. I've got this beat up, you know, Vauxhall Corsa. Um, and I drive from Glasgow to Fort William um, to do a little radio shows. And the thing that I loved about it was that one of the people before me um, was this seven year old girl that he'd 
given an opportunity to, to, to present the radio. Incredible. And it started from there. Um, I, I realised that this is what I wanted to do in my life, but I did need to make money at some point. Mm -hmm. um, an element of chance, opportunity. I'm always one of those people that believes that you create your own opportunity. Um, but one of the people he was working with on this community radio station was David Treasurer, um, who was working for one of the big radio stations in, in Glasgow. Um, and Willie, uh, David had asked him about me, and Willie had lied and said that I knew how to work a radio desk when I didn't. Um, but I think Willie just Fake it me. till you make Fake it. Fake it till you make it. I've yeah. made an entire career out of it. In fact, arguably, I'm still doing that. <laughs> Um, and he, um, yeah, David called me and says, look, do you want to come in and do a, what was called a tech op shift and basically work the, the mixing desk? And from there it grew. I ended up working on the biggest breakfast show in Scotland at the time. Decided to, to move um, for, for opportunities, moved to Newcastle because uh, I wanted to work for Galaxy, which was one of the cool mm. radio stations. Although I have to say that if I ever hear Kanye West stronger again or 50 Cent IO Technology on repeat, on repeat <laughs> you know, it'll be, you know, it'll be the end of me. Um, Ended up moving back to Glasgow um, to work um, there again uh, for the radio station I worked for, basically because of circumstances in my life. I had you know, family members who were unwell, so I wanted to go home. And uh, while I was there, it decided to be a good idea uh, to do a stunt that went horribly wrong, which I got fired for. I will tell you what it was. Um, I streaked in front of Ed Miliband, who was the leader of the Labour Party at the time. Um, and uh, yep, got fired for that, which was was probably the best career move I ever made. Wow. Yeah, and then you put is that on your CV? It, do you know? Funnily enough, I haven't put it on my LinkedIn no, profile. Okay. That uh, maybe I should. Um, yeah. You know, and I remember being asked about it in the job interview that I had for St Basil's. Well, they asked me a question where they said, um, "Have you ever done anything in your career that's went wrong, and have you learned from it?" And I remember thinking. They know, they know what I've done, haven't they? <laughs> that is loaded, yeah, that yeah, one. Yeah. You know, but I thought, I quite like poker, so I'll go all in, you know, and see. And so I just told them what happened. And I remember, like, months later, like, the guy who was the then company secretary for St. Basil's, he said, we knew about that. And I went, why did you? I thought you might have, you know. Um, anyway, I, I did that, moved here um, to, to Birmingham. I thought I would have been here for six months, if I'm honest. But the whole way I ended up working for, for St. Basil's, it was... It was a gradual thing, if I'm honest. And, and I think it happens to a lot of people in, in their lives where you start, you know, in your early part of your career, maybe not so much so with the current generation. And maybe I'm generalising and that's not fair. But, but, but when I was younger, it was get a job, make as much money as you can. That was it. Improve your quality of life, mm -hmm. right? But then, as I go into my early 30s, it was like, well, what's, what's important to me? What, what am I passionate about? And I kept coming back to, I come from Glasgow, I come from a fairly poor part of Glasgow. I think about the people I grew up with and the opportunities they had, and, and I can probably count in one hand the amount of us that made it, you know, or made it out, you know, and I, I'm not being overdramatic by saying that, you know, many, many people I grew up with, sadly no longer here, some have ended up with serious mental health, substance abuse issues, um, you know, some are in prison. So... I've always been passionate about fairness and opportunity and, and you know, regardless of your background, you, you have a right to be able to, mm -hmm. to succeed. And as this was happening, I'm working on this breakfast show, BRMB as it was, it became free radio now, as some of you, you might know who have, who have heard it. Um, and I was working with two really good mates, I mean, Foxy and Giuliano on that breakfast show, and we were having a great time. But on breakfast shows, it's, it sounds quite glamorous. You get to interview the stars of the day and, yeah, we got to you know, through various things, you know, interview all these pop stars and David Cameron came in for a, you know, an interview one time. I remember interviewing Tony Blair when he was Prime Minister. But actually, you're getting up at five in the morning and you're working right through to sometimes like seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night. What's the briefing process like for interviewing the Prime Minister? Uh, oh gosh, that was the most bizarre experience. See when, you, see when the Prime Minister's coming to see you. The day before, they will send like, you know, their agents and there's like, you know, people are arriving in suits with glasses on and, and literally doing a massive security check. Um, the, the actual interview itself is the easy part, the discussion, um, because, you know, politicians are very, you know, and, well, most of them are, or at least those ones, well, at least very safe without getting too political. Um, you know, they're, they're very amenable, you know, they're, 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 you know, they're, they're very, they're, they'll talk about anything, you know. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the whole process before it, the whole security thing is, is absolute. It's an absolute nightmare. I mean, if you, you should try and get them in and see what happens, you know. <laughs> You'll find helicopters flying above, you know, and, and all that stuff before it. Um, 
But yeah, the, 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 I was working on this great show, but but at the same time, I'm getting up at five o'clock, well, four o'clock in the morning to go to work, and and I start to notice people on the streets. You know, now you've noticed them before, but it's sort of it doesn't it doesn't you're so used to seeing these things become sanitized to it, you're desensitized to it, and um, eventually there was a particular moment when. I'm going to work on a Tuesday morning, it's like half four, quarter to five. I'm walking to the office, and where the car park was, you had to walk down Broad Street in Birmingham to get to it. And I noticed a guy at the Sainsbury's, outside, near the Sainsbury's, where um, where the office was for, for free radio. And uh, went to my work, um, left the office about half two, and I'm walking back, and he's still there. And it just clicked at that moment. It, literally that moment, I thought, man, we, have, we need to do better than this. This guy, maybe he's moved and he's came back. But right now I'm looking at someone that I saw literally 10 hours ago. And, and, and this is the best that we can do as society, mm -hmm. really. Um, so that started to really ebb away at me. I, by this time, I, I realised I knew my career in radio was starting to, to end. I mean, there was only so many daft, stupid stunts you could do. I was getting older. I wanted to settle a bit. Trying to avoid prison by Trying to avoid less prison. streaking. There, 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 was, there yeah. was definitely near misses. Yeah. Um, and and then this this job at St Basil's came up. And I'd never been a fundraiser before, you know. Um, knew a lot about communications and, you know, audiences and stuff like that and how you appeal to certain audiences and things. But I had no... No belief that I would get the job. Um, but they, they had a recruitment agency doing it, and, and there was this bizarre sort of twist of fate, I guess you would describe, where I saw the, the job, and I saw the number, and I called the number, and a guy from Scotland answered the phone. And we must have spent about 45 minutes talking about Scotland. And we didn't talk about the job at all. And at the end of this 45-minute conversation, he says, well, I think you'd be perfect for this. I mean, we haven't even talked about this, Ken. You know, we've been talking about Dundee and yeah. Glasgow and St yeah. Andrews and all that. How, how do you feel that early career then in, in radio has influenced how you how you actually on your fundraising and your charity work at St Basil's? Massively, absolutely massively. As I say, I didn't realise at the time. I thought, why have they appointed me to the role? I've never fundraised before. You know, I'd done, you know, I'd got a place in a half marathon or a marathon and done it for whatever charity I'd got the place for. But, but how do you become that... You know, that head of, that strategic lead, you know, where you're going to, you, you are given the task. I mean, I was given the task to, to, to turn us into a, a £1 million charity, you know. And St Basil's is funded through a variety of ways, but the, the fundraising element, and we always say that the, the fundraising element is, is there to prevent future homelessness. So I, all that work around employability workshops, life skills workshops. And I'm like, how, how am I going to raise that amount of money? you know, um, and get us to that that next level, you know. And I remember the previous incumbent in my role had said this, that like, she had got to the point, you know, and she was wanting to move on to, to another career anyway, but she said, I just felt I couldn't I couldn't take it any further. So I was like, well, why have they taken a punt on me when I knew that there was really qualified fundraisers, heads of, and that, that had been interviewed for the role. Um, and the reason I think they appointed me, and Jean might completely disagree, and the board may completely disagree, was that I understood people. You know, communications, you know, is that I know how to, in, in radio, you know, when, when you're coming up with radio content, you're coming up with radio content to suit the audience. A lot of radio stations, you know, when, when I when I was working at it, um, you did literally have a cardboard cutout of someone who represents your audience in the corner of the room, you know? So you're looking, so literally you don't forget who you're talking to. Using that skill set of, okay, well, how are we going to appeal to corporates? How are we going to appeal to the general public? You know, how are we going to appeal to faith groups or schools or all that? We we, we recognised really quickly, actually. I recognised really quickly. That's why they brought me into this role. So, yeah, when when I go and do, like the other day there, um, I, was at, um, I was at a primary school, you know? And what would I do when I go to a primary school? I'm not going to start talking about the intricate details of housing policy. I'm, what I'm doing is I'm actually wanting to talk to those those young people about homelessness and stereotypes of it. So what do I do? I get them to draw a homeless person. What does that look like? You know, get them to interact, to think about it. And then I'll challenge that stereotype by showing a video of what homelessness is really like. Mm -hmm. how, how does technology play its part <clears throat> in this sense? And how does it support you as a yeah. business to operate? Yeah. How does it help with, with fundraising? And also, yeah. how's, how can it enable and support the, the people you're trying to help as well? well? Technology is absolutely vital, especially the speed that it develops at, you know. Um, and the thing about the charity sector, I think sometimes we're a wee bit guilty of, you know, because I say guilty, and I don't mean it in a horrible sense, but we have this tendency to, to always be, because we have to be thinking about the front line, thinking about the immediate. 
and you do a lot of firefighting in, in the charity world, you know, because you're, you know, you're trying to get the money in to do whatever you're going to do. But also when you look at like a charity like St. Basil's, like two thirds of our staff are frontline, you know, and the, the importance of our work is the human connection. That's what it is, you know. So technology, and I've always said this about any sector, is it's got to improve that. It's got to aid that. So if you look at, for example, I remember I did this exercise a little while ago with, with some of our staff at St. Basil's where I said, okay, right, you know, a bit of a provocative question some people may, add, may say it is, but I said, uh, what do you do? What is it you do? And they go, I'm a support worker. All right, okay, right, you're a support worker. Okay, that's what I said. What's a support worker? What does that job description entail? And they would drive it off. And okay, all right, let me ask the question a different way. What have you done today? Right? And they're like, what do you mean? And I could see them going, oh, in panic, like we see. And I said, no, no, just tell me about what you did today. And I remember one of them saying to me, he says, well, well I helped one of the young people who was supporting write a, a letter to their parents. I says, that's what you do. That's the human connection mm -hmm. part of it. Obviously, a big part of what we do is like support plans, you know? Um, researching the best ways in order to, to improve lives, you know? So you're using tech for that. And the thing is that we are still at the, the early part of our journey, I think, about how we use, like, some of the new technology that's coming our way. I mean, one of the big things is artificial intelligence. Yeah. Obviously, it's massive. It's, it's massive for us for two reasons. It's obviously, like every business, it's going to change the way they work, you know, potentially. Um, so how do we use that in order to free up? Because one of the big things about a charity like St. Basil's is because we're working with vulnerable people, it's a lot of time spent on paperwork, yeah, you know, yeah. doing that stuff. How do we use this tech? It's the to, opportunity to augment yeah, it and scale yeah. up efficiency. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's a big yeah. thing for it. But but the thing is, how do we free up the time so that that support worker or that progression coach, as we call them at St. Mars, we, we, we use the word progression a lot because we progress people from a point in their life to another point mm -hmm. and hopefully mm -hmm. things are better. How do we get them to spend more time with helping to write that letter, to, to be that that person that's actually supporting mm -hmm. as opposed to filling in paperwork. But that, that's the first thing. This, the second thing as well that's important for us at St. Basil's is that we work with young people, you know, and a big part of our work is, is preparing young people for independence and preparing young people for the world that they're going to, to live in. Um, so if we're working, you know, to get young people into employment, what's that going to look like? Are we preparing young people correctly for the types of opportunities that are going to present themselves? Um, as, as, you know, as, as they come up, you know? So it's, so it's gonna be massive. When I look at things like, um, you know, from our own perspective in terms of fundraising, you know, we use tech to inform our decisions. In the, the olden days, that would be someone spending a lot of time researching, doing all that sort of stuff. But when we've got, you know, the tools that we've got at our disposal now where we can, we can get all this information really, really quickly, process it and then be able to make decisions, you know? But it's like anything. <clears throat> This tech's only as good as what you give it. Yeah. You know, the data you give it. I, I assume sort of data security is, is paramount for, oh, huge. For, for, for you guys as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, in terms of, you know, when you think about the, the type of data that we capture, you know, it's, it's, it's information on vulnerable young people. That has to be secure. That, that is, you know, so we are, I mean, we are so big on this whole thing about ensuring, you know, every other day, you know, you'll see a message on our Facebook workplace. You know, it's like, remember, you know, even just simple things like log your computer, you know, log your computer, because mm -hmm. obviously there's a lot of information there that's stored about young people, about, you know, plans, you know, information about circumstances, you know, yeah. that has really to be locked sensitive, down, yeah. really sensitive information. It can't just be, you know, left on a desk or anything like that, you know, or, or people can, you know, get access to that. It has to be absolutely on point because, you know, it's, it's people's lives. We're not just talking about, you know, data. That, you know, I mean, people talk about personal data. They talk about it like analytics and numbers and things. But this is people's lives we're talking about, you know, and, and a lot of this is the sort of information that it can't, it can't be made public for obvious reasons. So, yeah, hugely important for charities like ours. We, we touched on at the beginning, um, uh, you know, my personal involvement also in cities yes. with, with St. Basil's. Mm. Um, we've worked together before. We've, mm. we've supported some fundraising activities. Yeah. Um, we were at the big sleep out in Birmingham. Yep. Uh, I've done that a couple of years now. Yep. Millennium Point, and then previous to that, it was the cathedral. Yep. Um, uh, and also we had you at, at our charity golf day. Yep. Um, do you want to give us a, a 
a bit of a rundown. What does this year look like for St Basil's? Well, I mean, we've got a lot of events coming up. And, and just before I get into that, I mean, the support you guys have given us has been incredible, you know, really lovely. And uh, I remember even at that golf day, I, the thing I loved about it, obviously a lot of money was raised and that, that just allows us to be able to do what we do. The card so, machine and the beers help. Yeah, I it think, does help, you know, yeah. and, and you know, and you can help and notice. I've been doing this a long time now and there's no getting away from it when people have had a couple of beers and, and especially if they've had a great experience. And yeah. someone once said to me, a, a guy who did my job um, before the previous person, Lucy, it was Blair. He says, always remember, Barry, the first three letters of fundraising are fun, right? So if people are having a good time and fun and they engage with the charity, then they're going to want to support mm -hmm. it. But the thing I really loved about that and that I love about events like, um, you know, like that, that charity golf day is that it gives us an opportunity to talk to people we probably wouldn't get in front of. You know, we wouldn't, you know, it's, yeah, it's a great networking tool. There's no getting away from it. You bring your clients together, your customers, brilliant. You know, everybody has a good experience. But I just love that bringing together of people from different worlds, you know. And that's why I love the sleep out. You know, I love the fact that our sleep out, you will have, you know, the chief executive of whatever company doing it. And they'll be sleeping next to, you know, some of the, you know, one of the teachers from one of the local schools. Yep. You know, I, I love that. I always kind of hark back to the reason why things are founded in the first place. I mean, if you look at something like Facebook, you know, it wasn't founded to make Mark Zuckerberg and the shareholders tons of money. It has, clearly, right? But it was founded as a connection tool. You know, and, you know, there's various arguments about yeah. <laughs> the journey that's taken. I was, yeah. I was I've seen the film. I've seen, I've seen, we've all seen the film. The thing about it is it started as a tool to bring people together. So, yeah, we, we run a whole load of events. Our next one is probably my favourite, if I'm honest. Um, it's the Woof Run. I'm, I'm not even going to deny it. And I'll probably, if anybody from this particular company is listening, we'll probably I'll get a phone call from. But there's something called the Wolf Run. Right, mm -hmm. and and I, it's a play in words. The Woof Run, it's an obstacle course for dogs. That's what it is, you know. But the whole point of it was... Sounds the, barking mad It me. sounds barking yeah. mad. There's yeah. my tagline. You can tell you the market. <laughs> Look at that, right? You know, you've got that coming up. We've got our canal cycle challenge in May. And then we've got the hike event, which is our hike for homeless. Um, that takes place in June, June the 8th. And that's in Abergavenny over in Wales. We do this in a different place every single year. And then we start to move into like the sleep out events and stuff like that. We do, obviously, the big sleep out happens in Millennium Point. It'll be happening on the 24th of November, I want to say. And we also have lots of places and running events, which, you know, I'm going to be biased. I'm a runner, you know. I, I, you know, I like to make sure that we, you know, if people want to do like a London marathon or they want to do like a Great Birmingham run, we've got lots of places for that. They can, people can come and do that for us. We, we really can't do it without those people. So we're eternally grateful to them. Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks, Barry. Um, you know, we look forward to continuing to, to yeah. support you, and I'll see you at well, the next sleep out. Well, well, we really appreciate that. And as I say, with Intercity, you know, you guys, it's not just that though. You know, like um, the fundraising has been a massive thing for us, but the opportunities that, that as I say, you know, that, that to speak to people we would never have spoke to, um, is 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 huge as well. And the, the advice and counsel that we get from yourselves as well. And we always say this in our line of work that we, we, we're not we're not an island. You know, and the charity sector's not an island. You know, it's. We all work together. We all work collaboratively. Yeah, that's that. Thanks, Barry. Yep. I've got one final question for you. <laughs> Fine away, yeah. If you could see, and hopefully you're going to subscribe to our podcast oh, now. Oh, um, big fan, big fan of it. Who do you want to see on on the next episode of, of the F5? Do you know, it's a really good question. That. Um, I'm thinking about it. And, and there's the, I've been really fortunate to meet a lot of great people. But if I was to narrow it down to one person who's really supported me since day dot, like literally my first day since I came into to, to charity and into this sector, it'd be a, a woman called Fidelis Navis, who is the community director now of um, Edge Baston. Um, and I mentioned Fidelis um, because I, it literally was my first day and we were part of a something called Five of Hearts, which was a, a coming together of, of, I can't remember exactly all the charities that were involved in it, but we were one, Children's Hospital, Acorns, there was a couple of others, and apologies that I can't remember who it was, because it was nearly nine years ago, and I can barely remember what I had for breakfast this morning. Um, but Fidelis was at the Children's Hospital at the time, and she'd reached out, and we, we met, and we just had it off, you know, and she's been my go-to person, you know, since then. I think she'd be a great guest. I think she'd be really good. And and really, just the way that, that, that tech is really advancing in her role would really, really add value to this, you know? Which is already a brilliant podcast, but nothing to do with me, I should say. It's all you. So, <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Barry, for your yeah. recommendation. Um, well, Barry, it's been an absolute pleasure hosting you on the F5 uh, podcast. Um, been really interesting to hear about how tech enables St. Basil's and also 
how that sort of supports everyone that you're supporting as, as a business and your story and your background in, in radio. Uh, been incredible to hear about the events and, and, and your career. So thank you very much for, for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Well, thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. So thank you for having me on.